All right, everybody, uh, you're going to see my name is uh, Paul Minkley up here. That's not me, obviously. That's uh, whose account I use for these uh, webinars. Um, I'm just getting started and uh, already getting some Q&A. So if you're on here and you have a question at any time during a seminar, just go ahead and click the Q&A button and type in your, uh, your question, and I'll be able to answer it. Um, the seminar, I'm not exactly sure how long it'll go, but um, I'm breaking it down into three categories. At the end of each category, I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask some questions if you have any. Um, so I'm going to move that over here to the side. Sorry, I'm doing a little housekeeping here. Um, we've got quite a few uh, people online already. Um, this is my uh, webinar on targeting island calico bass, brought to you by Navionics and all the other companies that. Uh, Help me do what I do, and I uh, appreciate them, and I appreciate you coming here and watching. So uh, let's get started. Go, Brian Pro. There we go. So <clears throat> this webinar, we're going to be covering a few things. We're going to be breaking the island down by structure types and habitat. When I say the island, it's every island in this, you know, SoCal by here. It could be from Santa Rosa to the Coronado. They all fish similarly. So take what you learn here and apply it to where you fish. And, you know, even if you fish coastal, there's some stuff in here for you as well. Just try and find a few nuggets. I'm, you know, I, I'm going to tell you up front, I'm no expert on this. I'm someone who does it a lot, and uh, I've had success, but I'm not pretending to be the guy that knows everything here. But I'm going to – hopefully I can share some things with you that will make you reevaluate the way you look at conditions or situations to maybe improve your chances of catching some fish. Um, so again, breaking the island down by structure types and habitat, uh, why fish associate with each of these areas and where to target them, the presentations that will optimize your chances of getting bit, and then finally what we all want is to catch bigger fish, so adjusting your techniques and presentations to isolate those bigger fish. Um, It'll be a lot more fun and a lot less boring than this. So here we go. Why is it not doing this? Okay, here we go. So guys go to the islands and fish boiler rocks. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, it's the most exciting way to catch them. Um, here we have Jimmy Decker at Catalina, just on the east side of the uh, closure at the uh, Farnsworth Bank, the SMCA there, what MPA or whatever you call those things. Uh, which everybody should be aware of in fishy islands, there's a lot of them. Um, this is what we all think of when we think of, you know, oh, we're going to fish the boilers for bass and that type of stuff. But I'd like to really break down what's going on in this picture. And this is a picture I took a few years ago, and he didn't catch anything here. But he, if there were biting fish here, he certainly would have. Um, let me go to the next slide. So this is the uh, Navionics chart showing the spot that he was fishing specifically. And I got my air, uh, you can see my cursor here. These rocks were the ones you were fishing. Here's that SMCA or MPA line for uh, uh, the Farm Group Bank inshore closure, which you always want to stay off of. And we didn't fish near the closure due to there's the fact that there's bigger fish there. We fished near the closure due to that was the only spot at the island that actually had conditions. And one of the things I've noticed about the MPAs is they are in the best spots. So if you end up close to one, it's very clearly delineated on your uh, Navionic software and uh, or on your, or your, you know, your chart. Um, and by the way, these screen grabs are all from the Navionic website. So if you end up want to look around or you want to try something out, you can go to their Navionics.com, look at chart view, and you can scroll into your area. Um, the reason that we would have, you know, and again, I'm not going to lie to you, we didn't catch any fish here that day, but the reason those fish, that, that that's a fishy area is because the biggest factor when fishing boiler rocks is finding surgy areas that are in a place where bass would go to. So, you know, you can look at the best looking boiler rock anywhere on the coast, and if it's 60 yards from the closest deep water access, there's no reason for a bass to be in there. 
they have to basically, they, they're not attract, you know, they, everybody's like, oh, the foam is home or whatever, you know. Uh, they have to attract to places that have a high percentage of bringing them food. And if you go back to my cursor here that I'm showing on the screen, these black lines here show uh, contour lines, which is a depth increment. So you can see that it goes from being very shallow up here and very uniform depth, which is probably five or six feet or two feet or whatever. And then you get a lot of lines right here. This means that it's going from shallow to very deep very quickly. And those deep to shallow changes tend to push bait up towards structure. And bass are amber ambush predators, so they're going to set up near that structure and hide in the turbulence, basically. So they're in the shadow of these rocks, and they're taking advantage of that turbulence to capture bait fish from getting washed up against them by the current and the movement and ambushing them. So they're, they're looking for the easiest meal they can find. So aside from the spot that Jimmy was fishing in the, in the photo, there's another spot right here that's even better looking on the right hand corner of the screen, right? I'm using my mouse to show it because not only does it have deep water coming up the shallow water, but it has another deep pocket behind it. And that deep pocket would be a great place for bass to lay in there in the calm water and wait for bait fish to come up over that turbulent water, end up there disoriented, and they can eat them. So, bass are looking for the least amount of effort they can expend to. Uh, get a meal. You know, it's, it's you know, it's, it's very, uh, you know, fish and any animal in general is, is very different than a human in that we, we look at, we say, oh, I want to eat this or I want to eat that or whatever. Fish want to, ex it, it's, it's like a, a math equation for them. How much energy do I have to burn? How much nutrient will I get out of that? The bass are not going to chase an anchovy all over the place to eat that because there's no value in that to them. They're, program to know that the the uh, output has to be less than the input when they're feeding. So they're going to find the highest percentage areas. And it's not always easy to spot it from the surface, but if you look at a chart like this and you can see this little uh, declivity here, that seems like a place where there might be a bass way to eat something. It, you know, again, it might be impossible to go under because it's too rough, but if it's not, that would be something I would look at. Um, so when looking at boiler rocks, we're not just looking at how much turbulence there is. You know, if, if that was the case, uh, you know, Huntington Beach, the uh, shore break would be the best place to ever catch bass. It's very turbulent. There, there's no reason for a bass to be in there. There's no delivery system for food. There's no way that they can swim. And the rougher the water they're swimming in, the more energy they're burning. So it has to be a higher percentage spot. So the, you see these huge areas of very turbulent water that stretch out for hundreds of yards or whatever. Um, there would have to be an insane amount of food in there for a bass to want to go in there and eat that. And uh, let me move to the next slide. When it comes down to finding boiler rocks in general, there's three things that you look for. And the first thing is current. Always, wherever you're fishing bass, current is the biggest thing because you're looking for bass are stationary. They're ambush predators. So current is what delivers their food to them. So if there's no current, the chances of a bass having a bait fish brought by it diminish greatly. So you want to look for areas that have some water movement. As we can see here by this kelp in the uh, lower right-hand part of this picture, the current is actually going uphill at the island, which is perfect for the area that Jimmy's casting to because if there were bass that wanted to hide against structure and use the turbulent waters to hide them to ambush, they would be in a position where the current would carry the bait to them. And they're not always there, but that would be the most likely, you know, you pull up to a spot and you're like, oh, I'm gonna get a bite right here, and you do or don't, but uh, a lot of times that has to do with that. So water clarity is a big thing, that's the next, you know, and these are my biggest concerns when fishing boiler rocks in general is that if the water is too clear, the fish can see your bait from a tremendous distance away and they can identify it as something abnormal. And a lot of times when you get follower bass, they're like, come up right behind your bait the whole way. Those bass are following your bait because they're curious as to what 
what is this? <laughs> this, is, this is obviously not right. I'm going to look at it. I'm not sure what's going on. And um, a rule of thumb with bass, and this has nothing to do with boiler fishing, but anywhere you're fishing bass, if the water is very clear, you want to bring the bait with the current because bass, any, any stationary fish, like a bass hanging by a kelp frond or one holding in uh, up near structure, they, they have to have their noses into the current to hold their position. If they point the other direction, they get swept down wherever. So if the water's really clear, you want to bring your bait up from behind them and hope that they react and hit that bait when it passes them. Because if they get a good look at it coming the other way, they're going to go, oh, that's really weird. I'm going to turn around and look at that follow if they're bored or interested. Um, so clarity is a big thing. This You can see here in the photo, the uh, water's off color. It's not that milky horribleness. Um, excuse me. Um, a lot of times at Catalina, especially, you get that real silty white. Uh, you know, it's almost uh, it's sea bass water, for lack of a better term. Those aren't great places for bass to be because, or for you to catch bass. First of all, the the visibility is horrible, and second of all, they have to process a lot of. Um, sand that's in the water through their gills and I don't think they really care for that so much so they're not necessarily going to be in that area. I'm not sure why sea bass go in there. I think it's just because they they associate more with sand but I think calicos associate more with structure. Um, and the final final aspect of this is surge. So the water movement gives the bass a place to ambush. So what will happen is so we have current happening here in this area. The current is drawing, and you can watch my cursor here on the screen, the, the current is drawing bait fish towards this surge because they're just swimming. They're, they're basically holding still with the current carries them along the island. There would be a current of one or two miles an hour. So these fish have to swim pretty hard to stay stationary to go contrary. So a lot of times bait will just chill out and the current squeezes them along. Now you have an area here with some surge. That surge, you know, if anybody's ever driven their boat behind a, uh, a tanker or a freighter that's leaving the harbor, you know that the minute you hit that white water, everything gets kind of squirrely and your boat settles and you're not steering straight anymore. That's basically what happens to these bait fish. And they're disoriented by the way, hey, what's going on here? And that the bass know that once they get in there, they're not going to be paying attention to uh, predators, they're going to be trying to swim and orient themselves, and bass use that to take advantage of it. Um, and that's how they feed. So current, clarity, and surge are the biggest things whenever you're fishing bass. It could be an island, it could be on the coast, it could be uh, kelp, it could be in rock, it could be whatever. Those are the three things. You need at least two of them in any given situation. If you're fishing boiler rocks, you can get by with, with uh, clarity and surge or current and surge. If you're fishing kelp, current and clarity is, is fine as well. But these are, so the first one's the bait delivery system. The second one is giving you an advantage not to have your bait ident identified as an artificial lure. And the third one is, it's, a, it's an ambush point. Whereas, you know, a, a calico bass can hang out by a kelp frond or next to a rock, the surge, breaks up the sunlight and a bass can hide in, open, in plain sight within the surge. So there's two different worlds really here when it comes to uh, fishing boiler rocks. The first one, like you saw Jimmy fishing there, is fishing on the weather side of an island where there's a lot of water movement. Um, there's usually, even on a calm day, there will be a lot of surge, there will be a lot of movement. Boiler rocks on the lee side of the island are a different story altogether. You can see Matt here is casting to a, a rock here somewhere on the west end front side of Cat. We didn't catch any bass. We're going to have a nice yellow is outside of it. But um, <clears throat> the front side of these islands is more of a finesse fishery type of thing. These bass have, you can see there's very little water movement um, other than the surge point. So these bass are holding tighter to the structure. And if they're on the outer edge of the surge area, they have very good eyesight and they can see a lot of things. So you're actually trying to, whereas on the backside, they're, they're, you know, you're fishing a bait that they will see and 
um, actually try and feed on in these calm, very often very calm areas, you're trying to trigger a reaction bite. Um, so your bait presentation is a lot more specific. Um, when I'm fishing boilers on the backside, a lot of times I'll throw a hard or a uh, service iron or a big swim bait or a big weedless bait. When I'm fishing boiler rocks in the front, they see your master on a, a small crankbait, or you'll throw a smaller uh, hard bait. I'll show you some of these baits in a little bit. Um, these baits are more realistic, and they have a very definitive action that will get. Yeah, so, okay, so, yeah, hey, sorry, this is perfect. So, Nick Tharp, hi, Nick. Um, he's talking about lee sides of islands. You know, at Catalina, the front side of the island is the lee side on, you know, uh, Santa Cruz, Santa Cap, and Rose, but the actual back side of the island is the lee side. So, we want to look at the part of the island that has the least amount of movement, call that the lee. Uh, these fish in the lee of the island are going to be a lot more picky and critical about what you're going to uh, throw. So if you're going to throw a bait and actually try and get them to eat it, uh, it's going to be tough. It's not as easy. They're not as reactive. You can't see a spot, throw a bait in there. Oh, yeah, there is one. Eight, this stupid brown lure, you know, seven-inch lure, ten feet below the one-ounce head. Uh, you really have to trick these fish into biting. And uh, we had a per example of, uh, Last year during the SAVA event, I fished the uh, actually the lee side of the front side of uh, Santa Cruz, Nick. Um, very calm water where you would drive for a mile and see one area of very minimal surge where you'd have a two foot section of surge, maybe. But those fish were very keyed in on a uh, crankbait, on a very burn it, pause it, and on the floating. And that they would hit it because they would see that bait, they would come out, follow it, and they would get fired up. And if you just burn it back to the boat, you, they would not fire it at all. But if you pause it, it would float back past, and that would trigger this reaction bite. That's what really what we're looking for in these situations. So uh, erratic hard baits. Um, yes, here's that, another great question. Um, is tide more important when fishing leeward sides as opposed to windward? Yes, um, tide moves water, tide makes things happen. You know, I'm, I wasn't gonna talk too much about tides uh, in relation to islands, but islands because we go there when we can. And on any tide, there's gonna be a fishable area. You know, an, an area that might be great at high tide, might be horrible at low tide, but you can go in there and, and thank you for bringing it up. Um, I will get back to that a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> So, whereas fishing boiler rocks on the back side of an island and the weather side of an island is a lot more user friendly, uh, getting into the lee is, is, is a different situation. I'm going to give you an example. It's Coronado Islands last year. Uh, Matt and I fished an SBS tournament down there. And we found that the, you know, four to five pound calicos were biting. Hard baits, uh, he was fishing the Lucky Crap 190, I was fishing a, a crankbait um, in the surge on the weather side, a good distance off the island, surprisingly. I mean, they were in surge in 90 or 100 feet of water, 50 feet off the island. They were just using that surge as cover. And then when we go around the lee side of the island, I even stopped fishing. I just drove from the console, had Matt in the bow, and I would idle along and he'd say, stop, I'm going to make a cast here. And you'd have to make a cast within three or four feet to get a bite. But you would, you know, it's, the fish are just tighter to the structure. They're more wary of what they're looking at and uh, makes it a little trickier. Uh, I got a lot of stuff here and I'm going way too slow, I think. So um, <clears throat> this is a great picture I took of uh, Jimmy Decker at uh, Catalina. He, he and... Uh, uh, Jack Sol and I went to Cat to shoot photos for an article, and um, he took me to some of his favorite areas. And if you could figure out where this area is, I guess you get one of Jimmy's spots for free. But um, oh, you know, the the most of the guys that fish bass and have a trolling motor in the boat have this vision that hey, I'm gonna go fish boiler rocks or whatever, and I'm gonna put my troller in, and me and my buddy are gonna get up there in the bow, and we're gonna cast like we're freshwater bass fishermen. 
but we're going to do it in the ocean. It's very extreme and exciting and all that. Uh, the truth is, in, in a lot of these areas, you just go up in the bow and you put your trolling motor in. You know, you're going to, you may have not done it yet, but you will flip your boat one day because you can't keep yourself safe. The, the spot that Jimmy was fishing, uh, he had Jack up in the bow uh, fishing and swimming. We caught several fish in here. Um, Jimmy fished from the console and didn't even bother putting the trolling motor down because you could see the kelp in the water and that rock that, you know, this picture is pretty tame, but about 15 seconds later, we're sitting on the edge of a swimming pool, empty swimming pool, and that rock's at the bottom of it. If you're on your trolling motor, you can't get in there because you'll get that kelp wrapped around your prop, and you will not be able to move the boat when you need to move the boat. So what it comes down to is if you have two people on the boat or three people on the boat, one of the people has to commit to staying at the wheel. And even if you have the trolling motor in, and there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. In this situation here, had Jimmy not been at the wheel, we would have been on that rock four or five times over there. Instead, we had a safe, fun day of fishing. Um, I'll normally sacrifice myself because I'm just as happy when, yeah, I, you know, I, I drive the boat, so if anybody catches them, I catch them. That's the way I look at it. But um, you need to be aware of those things. But, you know, the reason that he fished this spot, even though it's dangerous, was because this is a really good area to catch fish. And you can look at your chart here on the next slide and see. So this little black and red thing, if you were to click on a Navionic chart, it would say this is a rock that is sometimes submerged and other times not. And this area around it in the circle here, look at the – every one of those black lines means a contour change. So this is a huge drop-off, and it's probably uh, – from this edge of the circle is 74 feet, and to, to the rock is zero feet. So this is a prime place for bait that's getting washed down the island by current to get pushed up into the zone. And those fish are going to be in there. Um, if you have an area that's got, like, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor here, but this really steep thing, that's – Similar, but it's so steep that there's nowhere for the fish to situate. It's basically a wall that they're up against. And they don't like that. They're not going to – that's not – they'd be on top of each other competing for the same fish. Here you have probably a 40 or 50-foot spot width-wise where these fish can spread out and all of them can ambush effectively in that kelp associated with that rock. So a lot of times when you're fishing boilers, you're not necessarily just casting to a rock. You're casting to the areas around it that are likely to hold fish. So next couple slides here are going to break this down. So this is uh, my friend Nick Tharp and uh, Scott Summers Gill on Scott's boat at uh, Santa Cruz Island. And Nick's on here, and I appreciate your input. This is a trip I took with them a few years ago where we fished to the backside of Santa Cruz, and they are fishing some – rock in the classic Channel Islands way of fishing calico bass. The, the rock that they're casting to here drops off just as dramatically as the stuff above the water. So the boat's in, you know, probably 20 feet of water, and they are casting up towards the rock and working their baits downhill to straighten it out. And these baits are probably four-inch swim baits with a, or, or a creature bait on a neck with a, you know, three-quarter and one-ounce head. Uh, War Baits Head or one of the other brands. And they're basically hopping these baits down to rocks and looking for fish that are looking to eat things that are hopping down those rocks, be it a bait fish or crab or you name it. Um, it's hard to tell from the photo, but the water is very clear in this, in this area. So you're, the likelihood of getting a bite in the top 10 feet of the water column is very low. You know, the fish can just see it too well. So you, most of your bites are going to come 10 to 30 feet down, which could be almost straight up and down. So another way to fish it is once you find that, okay, so these fish are biting 20 feet off the, off the rock itself, which could be in 15 or 20 feet of water. Instead of casting of the rock and working it down, you could just cast parallel to the rock and have your bait in that 20-foot range the entire way. It's kind of how we fish a break wall for guys that aren't really uh, experienced in doing that. So this is a great way to fish clean rock. And by clean rock, I mean there's no kelp. There's not a lot of other growth going on. You can fish a swim bait or a, or a creature bait. You can hop it down the wall and 
chances are, other than bumping it off a rock, you feel some, it's probably a fish. It's not going to be kelp or seagrass or whatever. But that's very rarely the case in areas that hold calicos. Um, a more likely scenario you're going to run into is what uh, Matt Florentino is fighting a nice bass here uh, and uh, at uh, the east end, I don't know, east, no, it would be south west end of uh, Santa Barbara Island. Um, the island, as you can see here, is extremely steep, but that steepness ends right where it hits the water. I fished here a couple weeks ago uh, with uh, Joey Shimizu and Patty, and we caught a couple of fish here. It was tough. Um, at the water line, the depth is obviously zero. Where this rock is, it's probably three or four feet, and where the boat is, although we're a good distance from shore, it's probably about 12 feet. Um, the rock that he happened to catch that fish by that's prominent in the photo is not what he was casting to. This is basically a reefy, well, I guess it's just rocky. It's not actually, you know, the difference between a reef and a rock is really nothing in Southern California, the same thing. Basically, it's, it's a very shallow rocky area that gent gently slopes out. And the reason that this area bites, and what you can't see in the photo, there's a, a finger of rock that comes out here to Subtle Island. And this is kind of a corner of the things get pushed into, bait fish, current comes in there. The bass and the, uh, learn to stage there. But these fish are coming off this shallow rock. And, and that day I fished in there with uh, Benny, uh, Matt, Ed, and, and, and Matt, and I fished in there. We probably caught 10 fish, but we probably lost 25 leadheads fishing in there because what we're doing is we're casting up shallow, holding a rod tip high, taking five or 10 turns, letting it sink back down, taking five or 10 turns, letting it sink back down. But it's so rocky, I mean, you can look at the, the shoreline. That same stuff continues out in the water. Those bass are just sitting on the bottom there waiting for something to get blown by the, uh, uh, so okay, here, very important question I have to I have to answer. So in every situation, as my friend Russ Calderella asked this, uh, in every situation he's asking if you fish mono to braid or, or braid to mono or straight braid, um, we fish straight braid 100% of the time with maybe four to five feet of uh, a fluorocarbon leader, very short. Sometimes three feet, two feet, depending on when my partner feels like retying, it could be six inches for me, but uh, having the, the no stretch of braid is imperative when fishing situations like this, at least in my opinion. Um, so if you getting back to the slide, and I'm sorry I'm all over the place, everyone trying to answer questions and, and uh, do everything here. Um, to get bit in these zones, these bass are just used, they, they spend all their time relating to the bottom. They're hiding little nooks and crannies, or, down among the seagrass and stuff, and they just wait, they look up, and if something comes by, they they bite it. These fish are not gonna chase something that's going by at a fast rate. You can't burn a bait through there necessarily and get a bite. But Matt got a nice one on a crank, or actually two fish on a crank bait. Um, do more notifications here. Oh. Okay, I'm not sure. If you're trying to chat me, uh, that's not the optimal way of doing it. Oh boy, here we go, and I'm all fell up. Okay, so in this case, these fish are basically relating to the bottom and waiting for fish to come to them, or big fish to come to them to feed. Um, this is not how everything works. So if you, if you go to a different spot and just try hopping your thing along the bottom, you're not gonna get the bites you want. And so the next one is, this is a classic situation. Catalina, Santa Cruz Island, got Nick Tharp here again from that same trip. Um, as far as retrieves go, uh, Brian's asking the question, um, you really, you know, it depends on, on, okay, so the question we have here is what retrieves work best? And the, and the, you know, the, the obvious answer is that to whatever the fish are keyed in on at this time. So it's like I mentioned before, there's, there's a slow bouncing it down rocks like a couple slides ago. There's raising up of the fish and dropping it back down. There's a, a reaction bite. Thing you're trying to get on the in the lee side of the island, you're going to need to find um, whatever works for those fish. So basically, I'll start out as fast as I can and slow down throughout the day to try and find the retrieve that the fish want. And the faster, the better for me because I'm very impatient. And uh, question regarding what test fluoro, uh, 
On non-reaction bites, I fish 40-pound fluoro. On reaction strikes, I fish 60-pound. If they're reacting to it, they're not looking at the at the leader. They're just reacting to what's happening. Um, now, here's, here's a huge uh, thing. that Just about anywhere you go and fish boiler bass, you're going to have kelp. And this is a perfect example. This photo shows that there's a rock, there's an open lane of water, and there's a bunch of kelp, and then there's you, the angler. Um, this could be the break wall, the way it's fishing right now. Uh, there's two bites to be had. There's the bite inside of the kelp, the fish associating with the rock, and the bite outside of the kelp, the fish associating with the kelp. To effectively target the fish associating with the rock, you're going to have to throw a weedless bait. Um, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You know, I use an MC 7-inch weedless. On um, this trip, Nick was throwing some weird-looking trout bait. I think it was savagey, but I'm not sure if I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Um, you need, or, you know, an, or a, 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 a jerk shad, gulp, or, a, you know, MC makes them as well. Something you can cast up into that shallow water and work back without getting it tangled in all the seagrass, and kelp, and all the other nonsense getting pushed around in that search. If you can't retrieve your bait through this area in here, this clean water, without getting it tangled in something, you're not, you might as well not even be fishing. Um, on the other side of the corner, you're fishing that outside edge of the kelp where Nick is here. You know, we have some current that's going downhill. You can fish this outside edge with either a weedless bait or a hard bait or a crank bait or even a swim bait sank down deeper. Um, so I have a question here about seasonal stuff. Um, there is no seasonal difference. I've got weedless surface fish in 55 degree water. I've got them on the bottom in 70 degree water. Um, if the water's 10 feet deep, the fish will bite any type of bait you throw. You don't have to go deep. You don't have to go slow. You don't have to do anything. So, Adam, I hope that answers your question. Um, so, again, going back to this, this photo here, you know, there's, if you were a fish looking to eat a bait fish, there's a couple of good options. And the first and most obvious would be on the outside edge of this kelp because that's the most likely area to have bait fish come by. Now, one of the problems about the most likely area is that that's the highest traffic area and that's likely the smaller bass you're going to be catching are going to be in the area where you catch a lot of bass are not necessarily going to do the bigger bass because the bigger bass don't really want to compete with the smaller and more agile 14 and 15 inch bass. One of the, you know, one of the things you have to keep in mind with, with calic is they grow very slowly and uh, a big bass might be 30 years old and that's a lot of time to get to know a, a set environment. So a bigger bass might know that, hey, there's a little pocket back in these rocks right here where I'm showing my mouse that get some current and some bait fish get delivered there. It's not a lot, but I don't have to burn any calories to, to sit here. It's calm. I'm in a pocket. And five fish come by an hour, and if I can eat three of those, I'm full. Bass are smart like that. I mean, they're not going to be, they don't want to compete. They don't want to race around and chase baits. They don't want to do anything. They want to, the bigger ones, they just want to sit there and consume and not burn calories. So you can get to know these areas and say, hey, you know, I see how this water swirls around here and make a cast to a spot that might be a higher percentage spot for something. Um, my advice in all these situations is go in and pay attention. Look at every cast. Look at every – try and make casts to specific spots and pay attention to what happens when you do that. And if, hit a bunch of different ones and say, hey, when I cast this spot just outside of the surge, I got a bite. And then two hours later, I cast to a similar spot and I got another bite. That's going to tell you that, hey, that might be a pattern. So let me try and figure this out a little bit more. It, it, it's not easy and it – not necessarily fun, but if you want to get better at it, you need to start thinking about why those bass are there. So take a look at the environment, break it down, say, hey, if I was bass, where would I be? Try that. Look for the easiest, you know, so the, the path of least resistance getting bait fish in your mouth is what bass are going to take. If it's too easy, there's going to be a lot of bass there and a bigger bass are not going to want to compete with that. So you need to look for a 
not as obvious spot to cast to to get those bites. And a lot of the, you know, oh, I cast in the six inch of water and I caught this eight pounder or whatever. Yeah, it's not because eight pounders live at six inches of water. It's that you just happen to cast in a spot that you knew or didn't know was a great ambush spot and the alpha fish in the bed was sitting there. So there's a difference between rocks that have kelp and kelp that are associated with rocks. This is a world famous uh, bass angler, Jack Soul, who's a uh, been doing this a lot longer than most of us has, and actually uh, could probably beat the hell out of all of us, even though he's 80 years old. A quick story, uh, probably 15 years ago, he's probably in his late 60s, uh, Jack and Mark Agashi and I fished, and uh, I had mentioned that I was studying karate, and I was pretty into it and stuff. Jack was telling me how he used to study with, uh, I want to say Hank Parker, but that's the fishing guy, but whoever the guy that brought uh, Kempo Karate to the United States, and I'm like, oh, yeah, old man, whatever, and he... Uh, at the gas station, he got me a couple of uh, pretty impressive holes that had me on my knees begging him to stop, and he made me put my face on the cement. It was pretty embarrassing in general, but he's a hell of a guy. Um, anyway, so Jack's fishing kelp that's associated with rock, and just because there's boil rocks don't, doesn't mean that's the first place those bass are going to be. Um, with boil rocks and the surge associated with it, they're going to have to swim harder. So if there's kelp near there that's calm, and you can see in this photo, this kelp is kind of laid up. It's not getting torn at by the current. It's just kind of chilling out. And, you know, Jack has always thrown a five inch uh, swim bait on a three quarter ounce head. And that's perfect for this situation because he can make casts along these individual clumps of kelp, let it sink down and line it slowly back. And he's getting a ton of bites doing that. I think he caught five or six fish in this spot. Whereas Jimmy was hammering the shoreline with bigger baits and never saw a fish. So just because there's boiler rocks doesn't mean those fish are necessarily associating with it. Um, so don't roll something out. Don't don't drive through where the fish are to get to where they you think they should be because they might not be. And great baits to fish in this type of situation. I would love to. You know, I would throw a service iron if I have planes like this here. I'd throw a big hard bait. Uh, Matt would throw weed lifts and complain that I'm not close enough to the kelp. I'm sure. And um, and Jack would fish a, a small swim bait and probably outfish both of us. So, okay, so I have, a, I have another question here real quick. Um, okay, so retrie retrieve speed and, and the colors of baits I'm going to talk about in a little bit. So, uh, Taylor, stand by. Um, so, I have another question about casting past the stringer or, or directly at it and let the bait drop. If you're, if there's, there are fish to be caught associated with stringers. And a lot of times, if you pull up on a stringer and throw your bait directly next to it and let it sink to the bottom, you will catch fish. But a lot of those fish are fish that are not necessarily actively feeding. If you cast past the stringer and bring it back, you're going to get the same amount of bites, and you might call in more fish. So we're trying to uh, – I'm trying to catch feeding fish rather than fish that might just be chilling out or whatever. So, uh, uh, Nate, I hope that answers your question. Um, and again, I really appreciate you guys asking a lot of questions. You're my rockfish article. Very few people did in the beginning, and then at the end, I had a pile that I couldn't answer all. So, um, so let, let's talk about you know getting in tight and fishing shallow because that's you know a very popular thing among people. Uh, during this year's uh, California Offshore Challenge uh, SWBA tournament a couple weeks ago, uh, Matt and I spent the entire tournament fishing, and I don't think we we're any deeper than ten feet. Of water for you know eight hours or sixteen hours of fishing over two days, and I based my game plan on trying to find um, and yes, uh, Eric Martin. All these types of all these things I'm giving you here work at islands and on the mainland as well. Absolutely, one hundred percent. I had come up with a game plan for fishing the COC where I was going to target structure on the front side of San Clemente Island. If you guys have fished the front side of San Clemente Island, there's almost no structure. There's hard bottom and 90 feet of water, and then there's sand, and then a tiny strip of rock and reef with, with stuff on it. You can see in, the, in this photo here, this, this darker stretch is the rock reef, and there's this fan kelp and, and other stuff. Excuse me, I need a drink of water. So, 
Matt and I had come up with a plan that we were just going to cover as many miles of island as we could, targeting that shallow stuff and seeing what we catch. But I had never fished her on my own boat. I'd fished her on sport boats. I'd fished yellowtail from the skip there. And I always knew that stuff was there, but I'd never actually fished it. So Google Earth is a great reference. You can zoom in on it. Um, so it's great to see stuff on Google Earth, but you can't really relate that when you're on the water unless you have a printout and say, oh, I think we're here. Um, this is what one of the spots on the front side of Clementi looked like uh, on my Navionics chart. And this has all the components of an area that would be a good shallow water spot. You have deep water access. Um, I think this water is only about 30 feet deep out here, but you can see that it's this, this uh, spaced out contour lines means that it's very flat, which tells me that's probably sand. You have another drop off on the outside edge of this. But for it to come up this steeply, that's telling me that there's hard bottom there because sand doesn't come up in a wall. Sand comes up like this, and it looks like lines like you have there with those uh, space ones. So here we have some, some deep water access that's pushing up into this little point, which has a plateau. And while this chart is not 100% accurate, I, can, I went and compared this to Google Earth. And it looked like this, and this, this, this shallow plateau actually has four distinct rocks and then the line of rocks on the inside. None of these rocks are above the surface. So that's a great way to say, hey, the, there's something here. Let me go look at that. And I went, we went and looked at that. We caught uh, several fish off this. Um, but these shallow fish are very much associated with the structure and if you can see this area around here all the just non-dark areas that's sand and these are rocks and there's rocks here on the shoreline so the calico bass aren't going to be laying in the sand uh trying to ambush anything so you're basically trying to concentrate all of your casts to these areas and once you figure out where those fish are holding in relation to those you can really speed up your your searching you don't have to look at every single rock or whatever you can say hey these fish are on these rocks and you know eight feet of water they're coming to two feet and they're certain type of this and they have a current going this way um and you could just you know almost uh, what we did we just drove on the main with matt standing in the bow looking and saying no hey i want to cast up there and uh, and did pretty well doing it now i have to preface this by saying on, on day two conditions changed horribly for us and we went from have a 20 pound plus bag and only catching four fish, but conditions change. And uh, yeah, there's nothing you can do about that. Um, so when fishing these shallow reefs and kelp, uh, this is a picture of Matt at Catalina. We're fishing uh, down towards the east end somewhere and you can, we're, we look like we're quite a ways off the beach, but we're probably only in 12 or 13 feet of water. Uh, at the end of his raw tip here is that dark stuff, and that is rock and kelp, and then you have some more. So basically, you're basically casting past a line of structure like you saw in a previous photo and trying to get a bite when you come across it, or casting parallel to that line of structure and hoping to get a, bat, a bite when you're coming uh, its length. Um, you need to fish baits that are going to be weedless. In these situations, I guess it's time for me to break out some of my stuff here. Um, so I'm going to get away from the uh, slideshow presentation for a second, and uh, oh, I'm trying to hold on a minute. I'm trying to figure out how to uh, not share my screen. And I'm not figuring it out. Oh, it's off here. Yeah, there we go. Um, bear with me. So, there are three basic baits that, that actually, there's a lot of basic baits. Let me get one more thing out here. Sorry. So, when fishing bass at islands, I have four, maybe five baits tied on. 
And um, the first one I'll have tied on would be a service iron. Um, you guys all know what that looks like. I fish a, a Taddy 45 or a Starman 112. Um, the next would be a hard bait, which there's a couple different kinds of hard baits. Um, there's bigger hard baits like this uh, Sibyl stick bait, stick shad, and the like a Lucky Graph 190. And these fish a lot like a service iron would. They're just long cast baits. They're going to wiggle around. You're going to draw fish in from a distance. Um, I would categorize all of them as the equivalent of a service iron, or it could be a Shimano wax wing, any of those type of things. These are basically cast and steady retreat baits that call fish in and, and you'll catch them. Um, the next would be a classic hard bait. Um, this is a uh, Rapala long cast 14. We had really good success with these at uh, Clemente the other day. Um, these are fish in a more jerky retrieve, uh, cast, wind out, pause, it'll, it'll sink or float, and you're going for a reaction bite. You're trying to mimic uh, a bait fish that's being chased by another bass in hopes that a bass will see that and try and eat that bait fish before the bass that it imagines is falling to bait fish has a chance to. Um, when fishing shallow like we were though at Clemente, even this little bill makes it impossible to fish is bait in certain zones, you're fishing parallel in two or three feet of water, and just the fact that this dives at three or four feet, it's getting hung up, and these single hooks make it nice. They have a great hookup ratio because they, uh, uh, I lost my train, I'm sorry. They have a good hookup ratio, but they don't snag the kelp. When they do snag the kelp, they tear out pretty easy, but even this smaller bill will make it tough to fish. Uh, so there's baits like the, this other Rapala that have no bill and they'll run about a foot down or whatever. Uh, so I, I have a question here. Uh, oh, at the Officer Challenge, gin clear, cold water with a F ton of bait, real hard bite. How do you fish it? We fish it with baits like this exactly. So the tougher the conditions, and yes, the SP Benno is a, another favorite of mine. That's another question I had. I've got a bunch of them right here. They're all tangled up, so I didn't take them out. But SP Meadow, this uh, this Rapala, I've got some Okuma uh, Savakir baits. They're about the same size. Anything this size range will work good. And um, what these uh, baits do is they have an erratic action, stop and go retrieve. So we're burning and pausing and burning and pausing. And they, they burn and they pause and they float up or they sink down a little bit. And it's during those pauses that you're going to get those bites. I got another chair request to bear with me a second. Uh, the hooks on the uh, on the Rapala, I, I'm not sure what the brand are, but they're just the standard hooks that they come with now. Um, that bait comes with a single hook, and I really like that. It makes them a lot easier to take off, too. The worst part is getting, especially when you get a double on Calgos. And I, you could ask uh, Jimmy Decker, I had to, he had to cut a treble hook out of my finger when I got a double on the on the uh, SP Minnow, last summer of his boat. Um, these are stop and go action, not steady one, burn, pause, or slow, speed up, slow down. You want it to look like bait fish are trying to run from something as opposed to bait fish are just all, because that's not gonna attract the, the predation and the reaction bite. Um, another great bait that we have success with even in open water in those shallow zones is the, uh, the Weedless swim bait, you can see this one's pretty chewed up from, a, or maybe you can't see it from the uh, tournament. But this, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you're gonna fish a weedless swim bait, but there's no kelp. Well, if the water's 10 feet deep, a bass will come up 10 feet deep to bait, even if they're in 100 feet of water, they'll come up 10 feet. So why not fish a bait on the surface? You're looking for a reaction strike, you're looking for something that's gonna race out and hit that bait. So don't associate the weedless baits necessarily with kelp, only because they have very good applications as well. And they have a big meaty hook, so if you actually do get one of those fish, you got a good chance of getting it. Um, another bait that's very underrated, but works well, and I think I probably hooked, the biggest fish I hooked during that tournament, I ended up losing it, um, is the jerk shad. And this is an MC jerk shad, seven inch on the owner's sled head, which, 
would be what I would give my wife if we were fishing the kelp beds so that she wouldn't stay the kelp and actually have a chance of catching something. And uh, tell you what, though, this is an amazing bait. In those situations, when fishing parallel in that shallow water, a lot of that is rock, and there's this uh, fan kelp that stands up. It's not very big, maybe a foot or so, and it's laid down by the current, but it makes a lot of holes, and those bass tend to sit in those holes looking up to feed. So you make a long cast, let it sink and hold your rod tip high, throw another three or four cranks, that bait will shoot up and it'll sink into those holes. And then you burn it again, it'll shoot up out of that hole. And then a lot of the bites you get are either right when it shoots up or you'll let it sink down and go to wind down and those fish will be on there. Um, and again, this, this is associated with being a finesse bait. I mean, I'll fish this for spotted bay bass, but I would fish a minimum of 40 pound liter um, on this, and I, you know, I had some pretty frayed lining with that because these fish are hanging in these rocks and these holes. These are the fish that are not actively out there feeding on the weedless bait or the hard bait. They're not act out there reacting to this bait. This is the bait that falls into where they're hanging out. They're like, oh, I gotta eat that, you know. So um, that's pretty much it with that. And um, since I'm showing baits here, I'm gonna give you guys a big secret. This right here. This is a five inch VA hose in the same color we fished the weedless. I'm going to call it the uh, matte Koch color for lack of a better term. It's a gold flake belly with a green back. And this is a, uh, I think, a half ounce uh, DMC boxer head. And um, if you're fishing in situations where there's rock, this boxer head is great because it fishes, the line comes off here, so it wants to rub over rock instead of getting caught. In and it tends to hop up, and I mean, you can buy these things, uh, depending on the size, two or three for four bucks, versus what you would pay for a, a weedless sled head, and uh, I'm not gonna say more than that, but uh, think about it. Um, but yeah, you know, we don't fish, I don't fish seven inch baits, I don't fish nine inch baits, if I got someone lead headed that says, and I, you know, it's uh, you know, Pat Sullivan years ago said, oh, elephants eat peanuts, I'm sure we've all heard that, but, uh, that's the truth. You know, you're going to get just as many bites on this bait from the same size fish as you are on a seven or nine inch bait. And if they bite this, they're probably going to get the hook. So there you go. I'm going to go back to my slideshow here really quick. I can figure out how to do that. Um, oh, sorry guys. Bear with me. Okay, so here's the next step. And this is, we're getting a little long here, so I'm going to go a little quicker. Um, I have a question about the ever throw a slug. Why or why not? Here's, I'm going to tell you all about it right now, Tim. Um, yes, there's, there's no, and by the way, Eric Barron, there's no jerking. It's just a, a, a wine, let it sink, wine, let it sink action. So, you know, kelp beds, be it at Catalina, Clemente, any of the Channel Islands, La Jolla, Palace Breeze, whatever, they all fish the same. And uh, you can see that I caught, you know, talk about catching fish, look, and I caught this bass in the eye. I'm not sure that he was very hungry, but uh, he posed for a photo. Um, at the islands, clear water is your worst enemy. This photo, it's a great photo. You can see island, you can see kelp, you can see the bottom. I'm in like 25 feet of water. You can see all this happy bay. This is garbage. If you see this, just keep driving. The, trust me. There's nothing to catch here. Okay, so here, here's, I'm gonna go over a couple of situations that are bad. This is the second worst condition you can find when fishing kelp. This kelp floating straight up, no current at all. You got a little bit of bait here scattered around, probably blacks in the first, whatever. You got good water color, but unless there's something else happening that's not being shown in this photo, you're not gonna catch anything here. You might get, if you fish this all day, you might get a handful of fish. The fish are not going to be, this is not conducive to biting fish. This is conducive to, oh, hey, look, I see a Garibaldi or, oh, you see that harbor seal swam by? Yeah, this is not good times here. Um, this is the worst case scenario. Here, we've got some current. You can see this kelp's laid down a little bit. Not a lot of current, but there's, you know, movement. But this bait, and a lot of this is blacksmith, there's per or uh, smelt, all kinds of nonsense. When they're all just hanging out and pointing different directions like that, they're having a good old time. They're acting like the landlord. When the fish are acting, when the bait fish are acting like the landlord, the landlord's not there. So you know what? 
keep driving again. And I know it's easy to see this in this photo that I took underwater, but you can see this from the surf. You can see bait in the water. You can see if, is the bait that I'm looking at acting scared? Is it just chilling out? Does it look happy? Is it falling? You know, do you have a smelt this big falling your weedless back to the boat? Yeah, there's no bunny bass. In. So this is probably the best photo of kelp I've ever taken. This is 100% the right stuff. We have current carrying that kelp bed back that way. We have bait fish swimming against the current, which tells me that those bait fish in a tight group, those bait fish are trying to get away from something. Those, you know, bait fish don't swim against the current unless they're feeding or unless they're trying to run. Because, again, just like any other fish, they're going to burn as little energy as they can. They'll just be carried with the current. So these bait fish right here are being pushed in a direction by either feeding or fear. And I know in this case it was fear because the bass were wide open with kelp in. We had a couple dozen fish. Uh, while I was holding the GoPro underwater taking pictures for this, uh, you know, for a, an article. Um, this is the leading edge of a kelp bed. This is where the bass will be. In this case, the bass weren't right on the leading edge. They were in a little thicker stuff about 20 feet back, and that's what these bait fish were running from. I think the current carried them towards the, bait, the, the, the kelp. When they got there, they encountered those uh, feeding cows, and they turned around and hauled ass out of them. So you don't necessarily need to see kelp on a surface to see that there's good current and fishy looking area. I don't run a hummingbird unit anymore. They're great. I run a rain marine now. I like this a little bit. Whereas, as you can see here, this is 120 feet right and 120 feet left. I can go 600 feet on each side with a new unit. But having side imaging, you guys are like, I don't need side imaging. I'm a calico fisherman. Well, you know, if you look at your up and down, you see a bunch of lines of kelp that are, oh, yeah, there's kelp here. It goes to 20 feet down. By looking at the side imaging, I can actually tell the current direction. And I can also see if there's schools of bait above or associated with that kelp and where they are in relation to that kelp. This photo was taken past the leading edge of the kelp bed, but I can see, hey, there's rock on the outside of this. this what you're seeing here is rock. And you can see kelp that's actually being laid down by the current. And there's bait, it's hard to see in this photo, but there's bait on this leading edge of it right here. So this is, I don't even need, it could be dirty water, it could be low light, I couldn't see any kelp at all, but I know that, hey, there's the leading edge of the bed, there's bait there, there's rock to this outside edge of it, there's not much out there, so the fish are gonna be on this side of the boat, and they're probably gonna be back that way on the leading edge of that kelp. Um, it's invaluable. Uh, you need to have your meter on. You need to be watching it while you're fishing kelp. Even though you're fishing visual kelp, you want to see this because this is going to tell you what you can't. It's, it's telling you an interpretation of what you saw in those photos. So, now, obviously, this is Palos Verdes. Um, I'm sharing these photos because I think that a lot of people fish weedless baits and kelp incorrectly, be it a slug, be it a Weedless bait, uh, any service bait, you need to really tighten up the way you fish. And Matt and I have an agreement where he fishes the bow. I don't ever put the trolling motor down when I'm in a kelp. I run from the main. I use current wind to help move the boat along. So that's a natural direction for things to happen. Um, if you're on your trolling motor, a lot of times you'll put your boat in unnatural direction or, or position in relation to where food would be coming from and things. So you want to keep that in mind. You want to keep going with, if the wind is coming a certain way or the current's going a certain way, bait is going to be relating to that in the same way. And if your bait is coming perpendicular to that, it's not as likely to be uh, appear natural to the fish. And I, you know, that's just my theory. I might be right or wrong. But what's shown in this photo here is Matt doing his typical sidearm wingless cast. You don't need to fire the spade out a million miles. Um, if you're watching like Bassmaster or whatever, these guys are making flip casts to areas or pitching baits, that's about as long as you should cast a weedless bait. You need, that, that takes a lot of boat movement to make it worthwhile, but you, you, you should never even need to cast, or you can cast overhand if you want, but you shouldn't be trying casting 200 feet, you should try and cast 50 feet. And, as you can see in this photo, this is not the end of Matt's cast. This is the moments after it hits the water. Here's the kelp 
stringer that he is casting you. He's casting the very precise spots. And the weedless bait is right here, and you can see a bass starting to boil behind the bait right there. So he cast to that stringer. He cast to the stringer that was here. He cast the stringer that was outside of that. He cast the stringer that was inside of it. So instead of making one long cast, you can make eight 20 and 30 foot cast to these things. And these fish are gonna bite that close to the boat. So you can see here that that bite that he can or that, that kelp stringer that he cast in the bite that he got is maybe no more than 15 feet off the bow of the boat. But the key is to get that bait past, you know, and what, what uh, Nate Carlson was asked about earlier is you are you are you putting the, the, the bait right on the stringer. In the case of a weedless uh, bait, you're wanting to look at the kelp. Analyze, hey, where would a bass be in relation to that kelp? What's the most likely? It's going to be on slightly down current of the edge, probably in the shadiest spot. And you want to put your bait right past that and wind it two or three feet before it's going to be in the bite zone. You don't want to be winding your bait 20 feet or 10 feet even before you get in the bite zone. So, yeah, so this is the next. I, I was uh, shooting it fast here uh, or, uh, you know, uh, taking first photos. This is, you know, a second and a half later. So Matt has hooked this fish. The stringer here that I'm pointing to with my mouth is where he hooked that. And there is nothing but clear water between Matt and that fish that he hooked. So that fish, once it gets the hook, is going to be in the boat. If you were to hook that fish back here or over here, you got a lot of stringers to, to deal with. And every one of those stringers can be a place where the bass will get under and get your hook off. So uh, you really need to not only look at ambush points, but look at a path of clear water between you and the bass because you know it, it for example Matt fishes in the bow I fish from the console I'm making the odd cast areas because he's like a I mean he's like a a vacuum every everything within 30 feet of the boat he's already hit there's no reason for him to cast it so I'll bomb the cast off the side and do the longer stuff so I'm fishing the console while I'm driving the boat um, he'll probably land 90 95 percent of the bites he gets when I'm making the long cast over nonsense, I'm looking to land 65, 70% because they're getting around kelp or they're digging down and stuff and coming off. Um, I said a question about with the current or against the current for presenting bait. Um, in dirty water, I bring it with the current. I want the fish to have time to see it. In clear water, I bring it against the current so that the fish doesn't have but a split second before it has to make a decision if it's going to bite it or not. And regarding bait colors and sizes and all this stuff, I mean, I've watched this for 10 years or how long I've been throwing the weed lifts. Um, if there's a biting bass on a stringer, it's going to bite the first bait that comes to it, regardless of what that bait is. And, you know, I just happen to have a hint here so I can find it. I'm gonna get away from sharing here for a second. This is a uh, Yozuri Hydro Mag Popper. That when the bluefin were really biting the uh, popper real well, we, Matt and I thought it'd be funny to take this out and catch calico bass on it. And we fished this thing like a weedless bait, and we caught calico bass popping this by every really good looking culture. They didn't want it, but there was biting fish here, and they ate it. And this, this is not a good calico bass bait, by the way. Um, but it shows you that it, the fish is at that point because it wants to eat something. If you throw anything even reasonable out there, it's going to eat it. So don't worry about the bait, the color. We throw green with a gold belly weedless. We throw green with a gold belly top hook bait and all year long. We never throw another color. Uh, you don't need to if they're going to buy it. So go back to uh, sharing my screen here. So anyway, you know, so hooking the closer bait to the boat. You know, one of the other things too is the closer your bait is to you when it's getting when you get a bite, you can see the fish eat the bait. And one of the biggest keys is, and we fish with a ninety degree angle. You can see in this photo, uh, his rod is here and the bait is over there, and that is a ninety degree angle because those fish will strike that bait and you know, use a softer rod to be a shock absorber so you can stop pointing. And if you just Every time you get a bite, you start reeling in, you're going to pull that bait out of the fish's mouth 60, 70% of the time. 
What that angle does is it allows you to visualize it, pause, let the fish turn, and then swing against it. And by doing that, you're going to have a good hook set. Whereas if you, it, it comes up and eats like this, and you pull that way, it's probably going to pull out. So if this is your bait, and this is the fish, it bites it, you pull, hook, it's coming out. If you let the fish do this, you're going to hook it. So I know that's kind of an oversimplification, but that's a big part. It's all visual. You know, you need to, and that's another reason why Matt has a much higher percentage. He'll be like, oh, oh there's a five pounder. I'm not going to swing because it just has a tail. I'm not going to be able to hook it. He can see that and hopefully not sting that fish and maybe get to bite again on another cast. Um, that's it. I, uh, I want to thank everybody. I'm going to be randomly drawing the name of uh, five participants and they'll receive either a gift certificate for a one-year subscription to Pacific Coast Sport Fishing Magazine or a BD Outdoors hat or shirt of their choice, and I will notify you guys by email. Uh, if you won the last seminar and I happen to draw your name again, uh, you're not going to win again. I'm sorry. I really appreciate everybody attending. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to spend a couple of minutes answering them. If not, thank you for coming.